Good morning. Hope you're all doing good and keeping safe. So for today's lecture, we will be having a brief uh, discussion on my functional appliances. This will be part two of the series. As for the learning outcome, at the end of the lecture, you should be able to define and describe the principles of functional appliances, classify functional appliances, and also explain the mode of action of functional appliances. So as we've already uh, discussed in the previous lecture, uh, you understood about uh, the treatment principles, how functional appliances work uh, by force application and force elimination. So for today's introduction, uh, we shall go into a little more details. So functional appliances are designed to enhance forward mandibular growth uh, in the treatment of distal occlusion by encouraging a functional displacement of mandibular condyles downwards and forwards in the glenoid fossa. So that is how the effects of uh, skeletal and dentito alveolar changes are uh, taking place. So they also reposition uh, the muscles of mastication and uh, create a positive proprioceptive response, thereby affecting further changes. In today's lecture, we will be discussing two appliances. One is spin block and the other one is the, an activator. So what is a twin block and how does it work? So twin block is uh, an appliance which comprises of inclined planes and intermaxillary and extra oral traction. So by combining the inclined planes with an intermaxillary and extra oral traction, the appliance is able to direct occlusal forces by causing a functional mandibular displacement. Uh, so how about the uh, inclined plane. How does it work? So basically what happens here is the occlusive forces are transmitted through the dentition and uh, these the forces provide a constant stimulus uh, to influence the rate of growth and the trabecular structure of the supporting bone. Uh, also the sensory feedback uh, which controls the muscular activity provides a functional stimulus or it can provide a deterrent to mandibular bone growth. So this is how uh, twin block uh, helps through the use of inclined planes and uh, intermaxillary and extra oral traction. Here you can see the upper and lower uh, blocks. Uh, the lower mandibular molars are usually kept free, whereas the upper appliance has uh, a screw and also has various retentive uh, components. Uh, usually the angulation between these two blocks is kept at 70 degrees to the occlusive plane uh, so as to apply a more horizontal force to encourage forward mandibular growth. So how do you choose uh, a patient to receive a twin block? So is there an ideal case selection? Yes, there can be. So if you come across angles class 2 division 1 with a proper arch form, you can uh, choose this particular appliance. If the lower arch is uncrowded and aligned, you can again uh, think of using this. If the upper arch is aligned or can be easily aligned with minimal uh, uh, movement or displacement of teeth, you can consider using a twin block. If there is an overjet of 10 to 12 millimeters and a deep overbite, that is also an ideal case for uh, a twin block. Also, a full unit distal occlusion in the buccal segments, a good buccal occlusion, and uh, the profile should improve clinically when the patient advances the mandible. So you can actually do this using VTO and then assist. Uh, also, you have to keep in mind that the patient needs to be in an active growth phase for the twin block to uh, take effect. Here you can see uh, the phases and the treatment time for using a twin block. So the phases of treatment will comprise of active phase, support phase and a retentive phase. 
So the active phase basically deals with the correction of any mal relationship in the sagittal plane, in the vertical plane, and also correction of occlusion. Whereas uh, the treatment time for active phase can vary uh, between six to nine months. Uh, when it comes to support phase, it is for an additional uh, time of three to six months. Uh, when it comes to retentive phase, uh, you will advise the patient to wear uh, the appliance for nine months. Uh, however, you can uh, advise a reduced uh, time of wear uh, as you see the changes uh, taking shape. So, uh, to put it in a nutshell, the total time you will advise the patient to wear a twin block appliance averages around 18 months, which is inclusive of the retentive period. How about the diagnosis and treatment planning? So as with any other orthodontic case, you will uh, take a detailed case history. You will record study models. You will also take some uh, x-rays and photographs of the patient to record the existing uh, uh, malformations. So this will aid in uh, diagnosis and also reaching a proper treatment plan. How about the appliance design and construction? So these appliances are uh, tooth and tissue bone. That is, they uh, receive support from both the tooth and the tissue of the upper and lower arches. The appliance is also designed to link several teeth together as anchor units, uh, whereby uh, it will limit the individual movement of teeth and also it aids in maximizing the Ortho, uh, sorry, orthopedic response to treatment. Uh, so you've already understood about anchorage. So the more teeth or uh, the more uh, tissues you can involve in uh, anchorage, you can uh, achieve faster results and also achieve stable results. So the same principle holds good for a twin block as well. So uh, basically what I'm trying to say is uh, if you were to link several teeth uh, together as anchor units, it will be advantageous for the uh, appliance to work. So the upper and uh, lower bite blocks have different components. So here we will see what are the parts of the upper bite block. It has a delta clasp. It has a ball and interdental clasp as well. Uh, they also have a C clasp. They have a labial row and also it has a, a screw in the midline so that's a mid, midline screw it can have an anterior uh, sagittal screw uh, also it can have a three-dimensional screw so the image you see is a conventional uh, bike block which is uh, designed by uh, clark and uh, you can see uh, one or more of the components in this particular block so for the lower uh, bite block the components are lesser. It has a delta clasp, C clasp, and ball and clasp. So, how about the bite registration? Usually, the twin block appliance is constructed after a bite uh, registration procedure, and uh, uh, during this, you will place the mandible uh, in an advanced position sagittally by around five to seven millimeters. And also vertically, the bite is uh, opened by three to five mill, uh, millimeters in the premolar region. And as uh, the bite block can uh, combine extraoral traction, that is an orthopedic traction, how does this work? So if you see uh, a severe uh, skeletal discrepancy, you can use extraoral traction. So it combines uh, or uses a uh, concord uh, face bow. Uh, which combines uh, extra oral traction with uh, intermaxillary traction. So the force uh, applied is around uh, 200 grams uh, for each side, uh, 8 to 10 hours a day. And uh, the intermaxillary force will be around 150 grams uh, uh, applied through the uh, concord face block. So uh, that's the orthopedic uh, force application. Uh, when it comes to uh, the usage of a twin block appliance. 
So that was uh, twin block appliance. So usually if a uh, twin block appliance is given, you can see uh, uh, some amount of changes uh, occurring in the patient in a matter of um, eight to 10 weeks. So now uh, the next appliance we're gonna discuss is activator. So the activator was originally uh, used by Vigo Anderson in 1908 in Denmark. However, it was developed by Kingsley in the year 1879 and uh, it was used as a loose fitting appliance. So uh, as the appliance is mobile, it transferred uh, functional stimuli to the jaws, teeth and the supporting tissues. Uh, Anderson called it a biomechanical working retainer and soon uh, it was used as a retainer in uh, fixed appliance therapy, particularly when patients were gone for uh, long periods of time or uh, the, the, uh, the time between their visits was uh, longer. So we shall see what are the objectives of an activator and we will also see what are the indications and contraindications of an activator and uh, the mode of action of an activator. So when it comes to the objectives, it is used to achieve major changes uh, in facial aesthetics also to achieve occlusal changes in the mesiodistal, vertical and transverse planes of space, uh, to achieve moderate changes uh, in uh, cases of apical-based dysplasia, also to increase the vertical dimensions and thereby assisting in the reduction of mandibular prognathism. How about the indications? So there are a number of indications. So here are the important ones for you to uh, remember. So used actively in growing individuals with a favorable growth pattern. Uh, both maxillary and mandibular teeth should be well aligned for the appliance to fit well and the mandibular incisor should be upright over the basal bone. Uh, you can also use the appliance to correct a partial or uh, a total correction of class 2 division 1 and division 2 cases. Also in uh, class 3 cases, it can be used for the correction of class 1 open bite, uh, class 1 a deep bite as well, and also as a preliminary treatment before any fixed appliance therapy is uh, initiated uh, to correct skeletal job, <coughs> excuse me, skeletal jaw relationships, and also can be used uh, as uh, a retentive uh, appliance and uh, Finally, it can be used uh, in children who lack uh, any sort of a vertical development of the uh, skeletal structures, especially the mandible. So these are some of the indications of uh, uh, activator appliance. Uh, when it comes to the contraindications, the appliance is not used in the correction of class 1 problems where you see crowded teeth and uh, if there is a disharmony between the tooth size and jaw size, uh, you would uh, not uh, use this particular appliance. Uh, also contraindicated in uh, decreased lower anterior facial height and uh, in cases of extreme vertical uh, mandibular growth. The appliance can also be not used in children whose lower incisors are severely proclined. Uh, can also be, uh, I mean, uh, it's also contraindicated in children with uh, nasal stenosis, which are uh, caused by structural problems within the nose or uh, chronic untreated allergy. Uh, also, it uh, has limited application in non growing individuals, and also patients exhibiting hyperdivergent or hyperdivergent skeletal patterns. Uh, the appliance is contraindicated in them as well. So uh, the activator appliance has certain limitations. So these limitations uh, can uh, result in uh, uh, difficulty of uh, treating certain kinds of tooth movement. Uh, active intrusion of teeth is difficult to achieve. Uh, so is the uh, correction of crowded teeth. Uh, and also the appliance has to be uh, used uh, in a growing individual and hence uh, it has no or limited uses in a non-growing uh, individual. Uh, 
and uh, you have to uh, be cautious during appliance construction so as to prevent mandibular anchorage slippage and also it tends to produce moderate mandibular rotations and hence uh, can increase the lower uh, anterior facial height so this is a uh, undesirable effect in patients who already have an excess facial height at the initiation of treatment and hence it has to be uh, wisely planned before you uh, deliver the appliance or before uh, you have decided to use this appliance in these individuals. So what are the movements uh, achievable through an activator? So in the vertical plane it is intrusion and extrusion. Uh, it can also uh, aid uh, expansion and contraction and it can also aid proclination and retroclination of teeth. So when it comes to intrusion and extrusion, uh, here you can selectively trim the activator to prevent uh, certain teeth from erupting while uh, maintaining a free uh, movement of other teeth. So what happens uh, during intrusion of teeth? So intrusion of the incisors is basically achieved uh, by loading the incisor edges of uh, these teeth with acrylic and also you can uh, add a labial bow uh, below the area of the greatest uh, convexity uh, which is uh, incisally uh, to aid in intrusion of uh, select teeth. And uh, when it comes to the intrusion of molars, uh, you will place the acrylic on the cusp tips uh, and the rest of the occlusal uh, uh, surface of the tooth is uh, left free. So this applies a vertical intrusive force on the molars. Uh, how about uh, extrusion of teeth? So for extrusion, uh, you will place uh, an extrusive uh, force uh, that is uh, on the lingual surface uh, is loaded. Uh, uh, that is the area of the greatest uh, convexity in the maxilla and below the area of the greatest convexity in the mandible. Uh, also, you can use uh, a labial bow to further aid in uh, extrusion. When it comes to molars, the extrusion is uh, basically brought about by loading the lingual surfaces above the area of uh, greatest convexity in maxilla and below the area of greatest convexity in mandible. So these are uh, some of the things uh, which you have to remember when it comes to an activator. The areas uh, uh, of loading are important because if you uh, do it in a wrong way, you might cause the undue or unnecessary tooth movement which might be uh, uh, intervening with the whole uh, treatment plan for that particular patient. So how can you protrude or uh, retrude uh, teeth with an activator? So if you want to protrude uh, incisors, so you can place the acrylic or you can load the lingual surfaces of the teeth with acrylic. So it can either be the entire uh, lingual surface or only the incisor portion of the lingual surface. And once you have loaded, uh, this uh, acrylic will uh, enable in uh, creating certain uh, movement, that is, it can uh, aid in uh, tipping of incisors labially. However, if you want to retrude, then you will uh, trim the acrylic away from the lingual surface, and also you can uh, construct uh, an active uh, labial bow, uh, uh, and uh, this will uh, aid in uh, retruding these anterior teeth. So how about the uh, expansion and uh, contraction? So for expansion and contraction, uh, you can uh, uh, load the lingual uh, surfaces uh, with uh, acrylic and these will actually provide uh, a basis for uh, uh, transverse movement of the teeth. Uh, if you were to uh, expand, you can uh, combine uh, a screw, that's a jack screw, into the appliance and uh, it will aid in further expansion of the arch. 
So the activator can have uh, several modifications. So it can be uh, an activator with a bow uh, by Schwartz. It can also be a Wunderer's modification. It can be a cyber nature of uh, mud, or it can also be uh, a cutout or uh, pallet free activator or it could be a car wet ski uh, activator or a modification. So these are some of the modifications. So uh, with that, uh, we have uh, covered uh, the basics of an activator. So it can be type one, type two, and type three. So type one can be used for the treatment of class two division one, uh, type two for class three, and uh, type three can be used for uh, bringing about asymmetric advancement, advancements of the mandible. So these are uh, some of the types of uh, an activator. So there can be uh, several uh, uses and functions of an activator as this is easily um, modifiable and uh, you can add or delete components to affect different kinds of tooth movements. So with that, uh, we have discussed uh, both uh, the activator and also uh, the twin block today. So with that, we will be uh, uh, ending uh, today's lecture. So with that, we've come to the last slide of today's topic. Thank you so much for listening.